Hi everyone and thank you for joining us today. Um, today we're going to be learning how to connect with audiences through citizen science and specifically an iNaturalist how-to training. Today's event is presented by Paddle the Gulf and Clara Zubrick with the Weeks Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. My name is Amy Gores, and I help to coordinate the work of Paddle the Gulf, along with the project leads from Noah, Becky Alley, and Kristen Larson, who you'll be hearing from later on in today's session during our closing. Okay, um, so now before we jump into the training, I do wanna give just a little bit of information about Paddle the Gulf. So what is it all about? And essentially, Paddle the Gulf is a network of organizations who are working together to help connect people to the coastal streams and rivers that end up flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. So our goal really is to get um, new paddlers out on the water um, to increase their connection um, to nature and to have a greater appreciation for our natural resources along the coast. For more information about Paddle the Gulf, I encourage you to visit our website at paddlethegulf.org. There's lots of information there about our work. Um, and one, one thing about the website I want to point out in particular is this page, um, the map page, which shows coastal blueways throughout the five Gulf states. Um, we're continuing to update this map and add to it over time. I think right now we have um, just over 100 trails up on the site. And if you are online and click on any of these icons, you'll get a pop-up with some additional information about that particular Blue Way Trail. So, you know, how long is the trail? What are trail amenities? Things to look out for. And then a link um, to the homepage of the managing organization for that Blue Way. So one of our key initiatives as part of Paddle the Gulf is citizen science. And so we're really working to help create citizen science and volunteer opportunities to help people get out of the, on the water and find their adventure with a purpose. And that's what leads us to today's training, where our goal is to learn how to use the iNaturalist app to incorporate citizen science into your outreach activities. And so for our purposes here at Paddle the Gulf, we're really hoping um, to get folks on the water, attending um, kayaking and canoe events, um, to, to kind of be doing citizen science as they're paddling. So kind of to have that additional education component to a paddling event. And so I'm gonna turn um, today's session over to Clara Zubrick, an educator with the Weeks Bay Reserve. Um, but before I do that, I do wanna read a quick bio for Clara to introduce her. So Clara works as an education specialist at Weeks Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve in Alabama, where she helps lead pre-K through 12th grade field trips, adult education programs, and citizen science projects. She enjoys sharing the beauty of South Alabama with communities of all ages from near and far, especially when it involves getting their feet wet or hands muddy. In her free time, she enjoys exploring the Gulf Coast biodiversity, being out on the water, and rescuing hermit crabs after her dog Emmett has collected them and buried them in the sand. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn the training over to Clara for her talk. Um, and I think as I turn it over, we're actually going to jump right into her session where she's going through um, an introductory overview of the Weeks Bay Reserve um, before she talks more about iNaturalist. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Clara. Uh, the Paddle the Gulf website. So these two green uh, location markers are where you can launch um, from Weeks Bay, and you see it connects all along the eastern shore of Mobile Bay and up Fish River, which is one of the rivers that feeds into Weeks Bay and supplies it with all that lovely fresh water. Um, the reserves um, have a lot of different sectors that they rely on to kind of accomplish that uh, conservation and education goal. Um, I work with education, um, so I get to do a lot of uh, field trips, um, teacher development, um, as well as a lot of community engagement. Um, and we do a lot of citizen science programs. We rely on those to connect and serve our community members. And there's 
a lot of different tools and a lot of different um, apps out there that are available for citizen science purposes. Um, NASA has a lot, their Globe Observer app for weather and climate. Um, there's Clean Swell that's put out by the Ocean Conservancy for collecting data on marine debris and litter. Um, eBird, a lot of people I think are probably very familiar with that, um, put out by Cornell's Ornithology Lab. Um, and it's been around for a long time collecting bird survey data. Um, EdMaps, which is another one specifically for invasive species. Um, and the one we're going to talk about today is this icon in the middle of the screen, the big green bird, and that's iNaturalist. Um, so just to give you a quick background start, this is a screenshot from the homepage of iNaturalist. Um, and if you're totally unfamiliar, my favorite way to describe iNaturalist for anyone is to uh, call it a community of naturalists that are um, connecting and sharing their natural communities. And I do want that on a t-shirt one day because I think it's a great quote. <laughs> um, so iNaturalist started as a uh, master's thesis project by a student out of um, University of California, and or Berkeley. And his name is Ken Ichi Ueda, and it is now a joint initiative of the uh, National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences. And its uh, primary goal is to connect people um, with the non-human world um, and really show the, the depth and the breadth of the biodiversity of our planet and how beautiful it is. Um, and kind of secondary to that, they are, uh, iNaturalist looks to um, provide valuable research grade data for scientists that are um, looking at population dynamics and species distribution. And so these are a couple stats from the iNaturalist website. And you can see that um, as you go and make observations on the app, uh, 73, you know, almost three quarters, 73% of the observations within iNaturalist are um, identified down to the species level. And of all of the observations that are on iNaturalist, about half make research grade status. And that research grade status is really important um, because that's what the scientific community is using. Um, that's what scientists are including in research on, like I said, species distribution, where things are being seen, um, especially, you know, in today's world, as climate change is something we are becoming more and more aware of daily, looking at where things are being observed, what time of year, um, it can be really valuable information. And so when I say research grade, there are specific things that contribute to an observation um, making research grade status. So not every observation on iNaturalist ends up being research grade, but if you have a photo, if you have a date and timestamp, and if you have a location associated with your observation, there's the possibility for it to make research grade status. Um, so those three basics you need, um, and then all of these other uh, points come into play for making research grade. Um, so you have to have, uh, like I said, that location. Um, the ID has to be supported by two or more identifiers. So it doesn't mean one person can't just make an identification and say this is what it is. It really draws on that community aspect of the app and requires a two-thirds majority um, agreement on what the species is before it makes research grade. And it does have to be identified down to the species level. Um, the organism has to be wild, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means later on. Um, so this, this research grade data is important and it's verifiable, and you can see they do take care to make sure um, it's meeting certain specifications. Um, so here's an assessment of an observation on a naturalist that, for example, didn't meet research grade. Um, and there's a couple reasons. Um, so it doesn't have an ID supported by two or more. Um, and it's not, it hasn't been identified down to the species level. So this observation stays kind of in a file within the app um, with all the other observations that need IDs. And like I said, iNaturalist, it's a community. Um, so 
people are able to go in and look at observations that don't yet have research grade identifications and they can go in and they can vote and suggest um, identifications um, and work towards getting it to that research grade status. And so where does that information go? So all of the research grade observations from iNaturalist contribute to a data set that's housed within the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. Um, and this is a really, really huge repository um, for data from all over. Um, it has data sets that go back to you know, museum specimens from the 18th century. Um, and data sets like the iNaturalist data set that have been gathered with people's smartphones um, in today's day and age. And so um, you can see the occurrence records, the over 50,000 different data sets, and iNaturalist is just one of these that contributes since it's freely available to researchers. They're able to go in and look at this information and use it in research and management practices and a tool, you know, it's a great tool for improving conservation of our biodiversity. So here is, um, if you're on the GBIF website, this is the iNaturalist um, data set. And I think it's once a week, um, new research grade observations are added. So it's continuously updated. Um, and up to date, the number of citations you can see are over a thousand. So people are using iNaturalist. Um, there's a press page on iNaturalist that you can go to and it shows you all of the articles that it's been cited. Um, and so when we talk about connecting, you know, iNaturalist and citizen science to ongoing research and conservation, this is how it's done. Um, so it's, it's not insignificant. It's not something that we say in passing. It really does make a big contribution to the scientific community having access to that data. Um, so I hope some of you, most of you, maybe you already had it downloaded um, onto your mobile device or you might have signed up for an account online. Um, I find that most people probably end up using the phone application. So I was gonna walk through a little bit about what that looks like. This is the home screen when you download it, um, you can sign in or create an account if you haven't already. And you can see there's lots of different options for signing up. Um, if you wanna log in with Facebook, I know sometimes that's uh, very easy and convenient when you're logging in on your smart device, um, because most people already have Facebook. Or just um, when you go to sign up, the only information they ask for is your um, username, password, and an email. So they're not really collecting a whole lot of information at all. It's very quick and easy. Um, and this is what it looks like. And there are differences between an iPhone, which you see on the left, and an Android device on the right. Um, the apps are different. The Android has a lot more, um, there's just a lot more functionalities. There's a lot more you can do with it um, through the mobile device. Um, when you log in to your account, this is the first page you go to, and it's just a list of your observations. Um, so right now we're looking at, uh, with a week's day <laughs> account that I made for the purposes of this uh, PowerPoint. And so you can see anything you've ever observed, it's tracked right here for you um, to go back on and look at along the bottom of the iPhone app, you can see your menu with the options to make an observation, any notifications, or if you want to explore the area and look and see at other people's observations. And on the Android, you access that menu through the three uh, parallel horizontal bars in the upper left of the app. So when it's time to make an observation, it's really simple. Um, on the iPhone, you know, you hit that camera where it says observe, or on the Android, this green circle with the plus sign. And you see a menu like this. And so this is kind of what I was talking about. The Android has a lot more options. Um, you can insert sound in audio files, um, either recording a sound if you're out and you're on a trail and you hear birds chirping, you know, you can record that sound, that bird call and upload it and people are able to identify it, or if you have sound files saved within your phone. Unfortunately, with the Apple, you don't have that option, um, but you know you can still add a photo or choose select from your camera roll. And this option to add an observation without media, 
Um, you are able to do that. However, remember, if there's no photo, there's no possibility for that observation to reach research grade status. So once you've made your observation, um, this is what it looks like on the Android device. And we're going to walk through all of the different um, filters and, and options when you're creating that observation. So your photos that you're submitting will appear or sound um, icons will appear at the top. We have a whole list of uh, different fields to kind of fill in. So the first thing is unknown view suggestions. This is where you go and make your best guess at what you think it is that you saw. And iNaturalist relies on a computer vision system, artificial intelligence, um, to make suggestions on what it thinks those images could be. And the really, really cool thing about iNaturalist, again, going back to talking about how it is, a huge community and everything that it's able to accomplish comes from that community of naturalists and observers that, um, you know, computer vision system is reinforced every time uh, a research grade observation is made. So the more you you as a user are identifying and confirming species, the more improved the um, suggestions become for other users. And so it's a really cool way of learning about your natural environment and also contributing and giving back. Um, you can make notes. These can sometimes be helpful for identifications or just for your personal memory. Um, if it's your first observation of a new species, sometimes that's cool to include. Um, you can put anything about the habitat or maybe the time of year you saw it. Um, you have metadata that's collected for um, date and timestamps. And when you download the app, you're asked uh, to allow um, location permissions. And so if you have that checked, you automatically, um, the, the observation is automatically recorded with the Latin long. Um, if you don't have your location permissions turned on, that's okay. You can select that field and go in and manually enter the location yourself. Um, and then you have an option for location visibility. So there's three different options, um, open, obscured, or private. You can go in and toggle these. So if you don't want other people seeing your observations for one reason or another, you can set it to private and then only you and the um, iNaturalist uh, application managers are able to see it. Um, or if you set it to obscured, it shows an obscured area um, that I think is I'm not sure quite the exact size of the area, um, and it changes the further you get from the equator, but uh, it will obscure it within that area. So it's kind of a general idea of where it was found, but people aren't going to be able to go right to that exact location. Um, and this is really beneficial for any time you document a rare listed species that might be vulnerable. Um, for example, here at Weeks Bay, we have a lot of pitcher plant bugs. So we, you know, don't want uh, any of those necessarily with open visibility. Um, we do have a public pitcher plant blog, but some of the other uh, areas are not freely accessible to the public. Um, and iNaturalist has something they call um, tax on geo privacy, where they automatically um, within the system are able to obscure the location for any listed species. So that's kind of neat that they, they do do a big part of that um, on their end without the user having to be conscious and aware. Um, is it captive or cultivated? <laughs> so yes, that is my dog Emmett. And yes, he really does like hunting for hermit crabs. Um, iNaturalist is focused on wild organisms and wild species. And it's not really designed for capturing your pets, your house plants that you might consider a pet, um, animals in zoos. Um, anything that, you know, was put into a place or planted specifically in that area um, by humans. So Emmett, the photos of my cute, lovely dog, I keep those on Instagram. <laughs> um, and any observations of things like that don't really need to be included um, in iNaturalist, unfortunately. However, the hermit crabs he might find, those certainly can be documented and added. And then you see also a field down here um, to add to projects. And we'll talk about that more later um, when we get more into what projects are um, and how to create them. 
Um, and then, of course, you can see you can always delete with the trash can icon in the bottom left um, if you decide you know, you don't want to add this observation right now. And you can add more photos uh, or sound files with those two options on the right. And that green circle is how you finally submit it. Um, but before you submit it, you don't want to leave your view suggestions, your um, identification box. You don't want to leave that blank, um, if possible. You want to click on it and you want to see what your suggestions are. And so, um, iNaturalist went, they looked at these pictures of this dragonfly and said, well, it looks like this great blue skimmer. It's visually similar, and it's also been seen nearby. And that seen nearby doesn't just mean, oh, you know, there's other observations of this nearby. It means there are research grade observations nearby. Um, and if you don't feel confident selecting that, you can just keep it maybe to the genus suggestion. Um, say, yeah, I think it's within the chasers and king skimmers. And if you're really even not sure of that, you know, you can type dragonfly or insects or even just animal. The point is you don't want to leave that box blank because if it's left blank, it makes it much harder for other users to um, discover and identify. So as long as there's something in that box to kind of direct it to some person to identify, that's the goal. Um, and again, looking at this middle picture where you have the list of suggestions, um, you might see the two opposing arrows. And within the Android app, it's really neat. You have this option by clicking those arrows to stack the pictures you took as well as the pictures from the suggestion. And so you can really um, compare more closely by looking at those pictures. Um, and if you think, yeah, it's a great blue skimmer. You click the check mark and that applies it as your selection for what you think you saw. And real quick, you'll also not notice on the Android app, you have this uh, binocular icon. And that allows you to toggle between sources um, for what are what's being suggested. And so if you have it set to the visually similar, which I think is the default, you know, it is, it's going to look at your picture and it's going to say, I think this is what it is because it looks like this. Whereas if you switch to research grade observations, it's only going to show you those research grade observations, which include that location information. So yeah, it looks like this, but it's also seen nearby, which is valuable because this dragonfly might look like a dragonfly that is in Russia or, you know, in Europe somewhere. And that's not going to be the same species, probably. So that's helpful to note. Unfortunately, you don't have this option on the iPhone. Um, and something really neat about the iNaturalist app um, and part of how it's a great tool for educating and learning, um, you can also select the suggestion. And when you do that, you're taken to a species page and it gives you a short description of the species off of Wikipedia. Um, and you can see a distribution map of uh, where the species has been observed. Um, and then you also have this uh, graph of, you know, when are species being observed? You know, when are they most commonly seen? Are they seen alive or dead? You know, what sex or life stage are we seeing? Um, and so that's always really fun to look at and that information is, can be valuable too. So this is the iPhone. Um, you can see it's, you don't have as many options, um, you know, in your suggestions, you don't have the binoculars. Um, still the same fields to pry out or to um, fill out. Um, their location privacy on the iPhone, it's this geo privacy um, field. And you still have the uh, distribution of the species on uh, the species profile, but you're missing all that other uh, data that you can find if you click the link to go to the website. So it's just a little bit more limited. You don't get um, as much information all at once, and that's okay. Um, so when you're making an observation, it's important to note a couple things. You want to get good photos and you want to get multiple photos and if you can, photos in focus. And so you can see examples here or, you know, what would be good quality pictures to allow research grade identification. Um, so there's this cypress tree, you have a full form and you also have up close looking at leaves. Um, in the middle of this group of three pictures is a willow and so you, you have the bark and the leaves and also some of the crown. So you can kind of see a little bit of the growth form. And then looking at this false shark's eye, you can look at um, 
multiple sides, multiple angles, and again, getting it in focus, having a nice, sharp, clear image. Um, and a really, really cool thing about iNaturalist, it doesn't have to be an alive specimen. Um, so this is a photo of a skeleton from what we think is a catfish. We posted it and it was identified. Um, and you can also post, you know, evidence left behind by animals. These are uh, some uh, insect galls. Um, I think the one on the right, that's a, a live oak gall um, by like a wasp species of some sort. Um, and so you can post these and there are people that will look at these and identify them to exactly you know what it is. Um, on the Smilax leaf here, I think it's still a type of gall um, or it might be a fungus. I, I can't remember quite exactly what um, it said this one came back as. But there's a lot of really there's there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do besides just posting pictures of uh, the animals themselves. It's any evidence of a wild organism. And going back real quick to looking on uh, your phones at the apps, there's also an explore option. And this is where you can go and see what's in your area, what's nearby. Um, this can be a really great tool if you're traveling to a new place um, and you need to explore, uh, you want to explore what's out there, what's around you, what's new that you don't have back home. Um, and also, I, I hope you might, you can see it, it's kind of small. Um, on the iPhone app on the left, where you have the map and that speaks Bay, um, you have all of the markers for identifications, there are those teardrop shapes, and then you have a circle that's north, uh, kind of in the, in the uh, center top middle of the map. And that's an example of what an obscured um, observation looks like, or an observation with an obscured location. So it's not giving an exact location, it's just saying this was seen in this area. And you can toggle the view on both apps between you know, a map or a grid or a list, um, and you can apply filters. You can see a filter option on the Android in the upper right-hand corner next to the search uh, bar. Um, so if you're really interested in just seeing, you know, what frogs or what fish are in the area, um, you have the option to do that. Um, okay, so real quick, um, I just wanted to pause and see if anybody had questions. Um, we are going to go online and look at, uh, talk about projects and guides on the browser. Um, but I do see some... Questions. Yeah, Clara, we've gotten a couple questions. Anyways, I'll help you out so you don't have to scroll through all the chat questions. One was answered, but just in case folks weren't following along, someone asked the question about whether or not you can ID scat. And the answer we got come back to, that came back was that yes, you can in the iNaturalist app. And then, yeah, that's right. It's I, It really is an amazing app and it comes from the fact, you know, it's real people that are going on the app and making these identifications and it's, you know, scientists that have specialized in specific species and they've studied these things and they know them so well and they participate in the community as well. Um, so it's, it's a great dynamic and you, there's so much you can do and so much you can put on there. Um, that benefits everyone. So two more questions have come in. One is, when uploading a photo, does selecting one of the visually similar options that is incorrect skew the iNaturalist data? I'm always worried about picking the wrong one. That's a great question. And again, it does not because whatever you assign to it, remember you still need two thirds majority agreement on what that organism is. So if you select something and that isn't actually what it is, there's gonna be a whole community of um, other people on this app that are gonna say, well, hang on, I think it might be this. And they'll make a suggestion and somebody else will come along and they might disagree with you as well and they'll agree with the other suggestion or they might make their own and until there's enough um, of that dialogue, that back and forth of what it might be, you're not gonna reach research grade status. So it takes a majority um, consensus. So don't be nervous about possibly, you know, making the wrong um, identification. Um, if you are really unsure, the best bet is to go, you know, up a tax on, um, you know, if you really, you, there's, you have no real reason or justification for what species it might be, maybe just leave it at genus or family. 
um, and let the iNaturalist community come in and, and help guide that identification. Um, but even if you get it wrong um, at first, it it will come back. And Thanks, Clara. Of, uh, and then there's one more, it looks like, before we switch image. over to the web. Um, but I'll let folks know that you can continue to keep chatting your questions as we go, even if they were pertaining to the phone, and we'll get back to them. So our last question before we switch over is, does it include information on if you identify an invasive species for your area? So I know listed species are denoted, um, you know, they, that's attached to the observation. I can't recall if something similar, I, I don't think invasive species are automatically noted as invasive for an area. Um, that would be something good to go back and look at. Um, however, you can create projects, which we're going to talk about. It's a great segue. Um, you can create projects specifically designed for um, identifying and collecting data on invasives in an area. Um, so I'll have to go back and check if iNaturalist knows you know, when a species is considered All right, invasive. Thanks for those questions, everybody, and for the question. answers, Clara. You guys keep them coming, and I'm going to go ahead and switch gears so Clara can share her computer screen. All right, Clara, you should have the option now to share your screen. And it looks like it's loading for me right now. All right, so we're seeing the iNaturalist webpage. Oh, great, okay. So um, you can see there's a big map when you go to uh, iNaturalist um, and all of the red dots and those are all observations with the darker shades being where, you know, it's more concentrated. Um, there's more observations in that area. So if you scroll in, and I hope I'm not giving anybody too much whiplash, um, you know, here's the Gulf of Mexico, and it shows up, you know, a list of organisms um, in that area. And if you hit redo search and map for that area you've scrolled in, it'll show some of the most recent um, observations for the area of the map you're seeing. Um, so you can see that reflected. There's spider warts and shorthorn grasshoppers. Um, and that's just on, you know, this explore page of iNaturalist. Um, so you can see in this area of the Gulf, we're seeing um, over 5 million observations with 35,000 different species. Um, and, you know, it tells you information about how many observers there are, as well as identifiers. So observers are adding observations. They're making, taking those pictures and uploading them or those sounds and uploading them. And then these identifiers are who are coming along and saying, well, I think it might be this, and maybe it's this, and supporting that and getting those observations to research grade status. Um, another neat thing you can do on this page, um, you can search for specific species up here or you can search um, in a specific location. Um, so, I don't know, let's say we wanted to look at some of the frogs in, let's say, uh, Baldwin County. You can do that and all of a sudden your search is refined uh, to exactly what it was that you know, you're intending to look for. Um, and that's a really neat way to learn about, you know, some of the species in your area if you're really interested in a particular one um, or group of animals or plants. This is a great way to kind of get started and learn about what's out there and what you can see and find. Um, along the top of the page, you'll also see other tabs. Um, I'm logged into my account right now, which is over here. You know, I can have these options to go look at my account um, if I have new notifications or comments on observations or messages. Um, or I can upload as well. Um, and so you can absolutely, you can upload photos through the browser. Um, it's, it's really simple. Um, same process, same field as when you're uh, going through with your um, application on your phone. Um, and then there's these community tabs which show you um, journal posts and forums and projects, which we're going to talk about um, in just a minute here. There's information on identifying, um, and there's a more page with still more uh, teacher's guides, which can be really valuable. This help takes you to the iNaturalist FAQ, 
Um, site stats, you know, again, I'm showing you, you know, the uh, percent of observations identified the species or, you know, that um, research grade percentage um, stat. So there's a lot you can do. There's, they have a lot of valuable resources on here. Um, and kind of getting into the citizen science part of it, talking about projects. So when you go to the projects page, you click projects. This is the page it takes you to. And they'll have some featured projects um, for you to look at. And they have recently active projects. And this is really fun. This is something that I like to do in my free time. <laughs> um, flora of Russia or, you know, Winnipeg region, City Nature Challenge. You can explore so many different places. Um, and there's so much out there. Nudibranchs and sea slugs of Southern Africa. <laughs> it's, it's amazing the things you can see and learn about and, you know, the access you have at your fingertips. Um, and there's a few different uh, ways you can set projects up on iNaturalist. So if you're an organization wanting to look into setting up a project, um, you have to have a certain amount of observations uh, linked to your account. And I think it's around 50 before you're able to start a project. And that's just because iNaturalist wants to ensure, you know, you kind of have a feel for what's going on. And that project's probably going to be, you know, valuable and you're going to be informed with what you're doing. Um, so when you're ready to start a project, you just click that green button, takes you to this page, and it tells you a little bit about projects. Um, you know, again, I talked about there's a few different kinds. You can have collection projects or umbrella projects. Um, we did a backyard bio blitz here in Alabama, and that was a collection project. And um, it's basically a saved observation observation search. So when I filtered out frogs and toads in Baldwin County, Alabama, um, you that's kind of how a collection project works. It's saying like, this is what I want shown in this project for this time period in this location. Um, it's not really necessary to start a collection project for frogs and toads in Alabama because, you know, I can just type that into the search bar. Um, but if you were doing a bio blitz like we did, for example, which is, is really just a, a, an event focused on capturing as much biodiversity in an area for a specific time. And when you have that uh, data housed in a specific place for people to see and interact with, that's kind of the value of a project and, and more what they're geared towards. Um, and then you also have umbrella projects, which are just a bunch of collection projects housed together. Um, and we'll go through examples of these in a minute. Um, if you wanted to view samples, iNaturalist has samples that you can view and you can get started here. Um, and when you click on that, it takes you to this page where you put in project details, names. If you're artsy, you can add banners and icons. Um, or if you're like me, you get your artsy friend to make banners and icons for you. Um, you can put a project summary. Um, and here are the observation requirements. So for the Alabama Backyard Bio Blitz, you know, we were focused on let's find, uh, you know, observations in Alabama on this day. Um, so, you know, we filled that out for that. And so there's just a lot of information here to explore and uh, different ways you can use it. Um, you can add exclusion filters. So maybe you wanted to look at um, chondrichthys or, you know, uh, cartilaginous fish, but you really just wanted sharks. You could go in and exclude um, the chimera families and the skates and rays families that are cartilaginous, but they're not sharks. Um, so there's a really, there's a lot you can do. Um, here, you know, we were interested for our bio blitz only one day, so we put an exact date and we typed it in. Um, and it, you know, was like ran the whole day. Um, if you're looking for, you know, months, you can enter that in. Um, so there's really, there's a lot you can do here. Um, this trust allows members to share hidden coordinates with you. Um, so if you're interested in finding those rare species, that's one way you can do that. Um, let's see, you also have guides on iNaturalist. Um, and this allows you to create field guides. Um, and so it can be anything, you know, coastal life of Kine or trees, shrubs, and vines of Prescott Farms. So it's a field guide for what you will find in that area. Um, an example of one here is from the GTN Research Reserve, which is on the um, Atlantic coast of Florida. They have one for their plankton. 
Um, and so, you know, you can go in and you can find the plankton you would find along the Atlantic coast of Florida there around the reserve. So there's, there's a couple different things you can do there that's really um, great. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and go back to the PowerPoint and get my webcam started. There we go. Um, and so real quick, I just kind of wanted to talk through, um, you know, how we organize our backyard bio blitz. You know, you can go in and create the project, but there are a few important things to kind of keep in mind when you're planning something like this. Um, this goes for a bio blitz or any event that you're using iNaturalist for. Um, know your goal. Um, so for us, we, um, Myself and our education coordinator, Angela Underwood, were wanting to do something during the summer of 2020 uh, that was socially distanced and safe for people to participate in, but also engaged them with the reserve and got them outside um, and provided, you know, something fun and for them to look forward to. So we plan, our, our goal was to get people outside and connected with nature. Um, we planned it around World Environment Day, whose uh, theme for that year was biodiversity, which a little bit of a, a humble brag, um, you know, at the time of the bio blitz, Alabama was ranked number five in the country for biodiversity. We're now ranked number four. Uh, we overtook New Mexico. So there's a lot of biodiversity here, and our goal is to get people engaged with that um, in a safe, responsible way. We had a backyard bio blitz. They just went out in their backyard and made observations of what they found there. Um, know your partners. So it would not have been possible um, for us to carry this out and plan this out without relying on a couple key people and, and organizations, mainly um, Ro uh, Roger Burkhead with the um, Alabama Math Science and Technology Initiative, and also Rick O'Connor with uh, Florida Sea Green. They gave a lot of helpful tips and pointers. And there were a lot of other organizations as well that helped us get the word out and helped promote it and share um, all of our posts about it. And I know there's a lot of people left off of this list, but you, know, you can see we connected with a lot of people and if you're organizing a project you need to to draw on those connections um, because just making that project in iNaturalist is not going to get the word out so you need to find ways use social media um, to really promote it and that's exactly what we did so we had uh, partners that helped us um, plan it out and get started and then we promoted it and they helped share posts like i said um, and we also created videos on our Facebook page to let people know what the Backyard Bio Blitz was, um, you know, things you might see during your Backyard Bio Blitz and how to use iNaturalist since that was the um, route we took for recording these observations. Um, you need to have a plan um, for the day of the event. You want to know how this is going, how you see this, you know, carrying out um, you know, in our case, like I said, we were doing it socially distanced. There wasn't anything live in person, but we still wanted to find a way to get people connected with the reserve and highlight the reserve and, and highlight what we had to offer as part of, you know, the biodiverse state that is Alabama. And so we did Facebook Live events to draw people in. Um, if you're having an in-person event, you might have different guides for looking at specific species. Um, and of course, with any plan, you have to plan for things to go, not go according to plan. Um, so here's an example of me realizing during one of our Facebook Lives that I stepped in a fire ant bed. <laughs> so you've got to be flexible and, and kind of take these opportunities to just go with what happens and, and understand that the value is in getting people outside and connecting with them and connecting them to their communities. And of course, at the very end, you want to have a plan for what's next. Um, like all citizen science projects, um, the value really is in allowing those communities to kind of take ownership and, and really see and understand the value of what it is that they're contributing. Um, so we had a lot of outreach after the event as well to share, you know, what the BioBlitz accomplished. Um, you know, we let people know, like, look, there is a lot of uh, communities and observations made throughout the state of Alabama. Of course, a lot was concentrated in our coastal counties, but we had people in Birmingham and Huntsville as well contributing observations. And we you know, got to see what the most common observations were for Alabama, which was the Northern Cardinal and Virginia Creeper and Trumpet Vine. Um, so it was, it was a really 
it was a great day. It was a great fun event, but that wasn't the end. You know, you have to close it out. And like I said, with it being a citizen science project, give them a way to connect it back to their daily lives and also allow them to take ownership of what it was they contributed. And bio blitzes aren't the only thing you can do. Um, you can start projects for invasive species monitoring, and then you can use that information to create guides. Um, so somebody asked about, you know, how it tracks invasive species. Um, you can create projects with specific um, species that you're looking for, and it'll collect all those observations, and then you're able to map it and plan out um, you know, roundups to try and exterminate some of these species or get them out of an area. And that can be a great way to track if, uh, you know, pristine habitat starts to see, you know, an infestation of an invasive. Um, you can do listed species monitoring. You know, you can look or, you know, keep track of your diamondback terrapin um, observances and your manatees and your pitcher plants and see if these are popping up in new areas um, or if you're seeing less and less of them. So you can start projects for keeping up with this sort of stuff too. And you can also do water quality monitoring, sort of like the guide we saw from the GTM Research Reserve. Um, there are projects for monitoring um, plankton in the water. Um, and this can contribute to algal bloom science and kind of monitoring this and seeing what's going on. Um, you know, Southern California has this harmful algal bloom watch on um, the cyanoscope for cyanobacteria monitoring. Um, and I think that's, you know, across the country. Um, so there's a lot you can do that doesn't just have to be a bio blitz, doesn't just have to be a project. Um, it's kind of up to your imagination, you know, what, what your goal is and then kind of planning it out and how you're going to facilitate it. Um, so I think, I think that was all I had, and I know I kind of went pretty quickly through the last bit. I was trying to make sure we had time for questions at the end. So questions. And yeah, so we did have a question like coming, Clara, when you were going on. through the website. It was from Mindy, and she was wondering if the search function um, was on the phone app as well. I don't know if you know exactly which part that might refer to. Yes, um, so if, you, if you're going back and you want to look for a specific, um, you know, species in a specific area, I know the Android app has that capability. Um, and I think the iPhone might as well to a little bit more limited extent, like you might be able to look for species, um, but not necessarily within an area, you might be limited to your area. Thanks. Um, and then Elizabeth. Okay. So I hope that answers your question. Go ahead, Clara. And again, you can Thanks. find... You Sorry, I was just saying find, um, you know, that option on the Android app by going up into that upper right hand corner, you should see a filters option. And that's where you would go in and apply those filters and search for something specific. Or if there's an app. Or you All right. A, the next question is from process. Elizabeth and it's a project question. So does a person own the project or can it be created in the name of a school or an agency? The reason I ask is if an individual creates the project but then leaves the organization, is access gone? That's a great question. So it would depend on how you set up the project, um, being if you set it up with your personal iNaturalist account or an account linked with that organization that you then wouldn't have access to when you left the organization. And you can also add multiple administrators um, to help you run the project. So it's it's all in how you set it up. Um, it's tied to an account initially when you create it. Like I said, you can add more administrators. And you know, at the end of the day, the information housed within that project, you don't own really nobody really owns it except for um, the individuals that are contributing those observations, you know, like the images and everything like that is theirs. And then the only person I believe that can come back and delete the project then is going to be an administrator or whoever. All right. Started and one more question. So did you share um, this with multiple language users? And do you know if that's possible? For our BioBlitz event, I I don't know, um, 
the demographic of you know who participated. I will say there are partner organizations um, or uh, there I naturalist uh, I, I'm not sure what to call it, but basically I naturalist as we know it in America you know is administered by National Geographic and the California um, Science Institution. Um, so, but there are other organizations in other countries that administer iNaturalist accounts for those areas and those regions. And so there is um, a map of those locations. And I think if you go on the iNaturalist um, website, maybe in there about, they, can, they tell you a little bit more about uh, what those partner organizations are um, and, and how you can find data from those places. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if that really answers your question. Um, I'm not sure about language settings or anything like that when you go so, into Yeah, that might be something that we can follow up on um, when we share the recording oh, okay. after this event. And I see yeah. there's one more question here that I don't think we're going to have time to get to. So maybe that's another one that we can share some information as a follow up to this training um, with the link to view the session. And it's related to instructions for students to use as a formal class assignment. So maybe something to think about and we'll provide some additional information. So maybe stay tuned in your inboxes, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Clara. Um, that was wonderful. And I'm going to switch over to close this out now. All right, so I'll hop on camera now. So um, once again, I really wanna thank Clara Zubrick and the Weeks Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve for lending her to us for this hour. I know that was really informative for me and I'm excited to pull out my phone um, and have a little bit more insight into what I'm doing um, as I'm using the app. Uh, we have a poll question to the right-hand side of your screen. If you wouldn't mind answering that poll question before you close out, we just want to make sure um, that this training did meet your needs um, and help increase your knowledge of how to use the iNaturalist app. And then if you're interested um, in sharing your email address with us, we can keep you informed of upcoming events like this. And with that, Kristen, I'm going to ask um, if you don't mind hopping back on camera to close this out um, and to let folks know what's coming up next month. Let's see, we might need to give you camera access. There you go. Great, thank Perfect. you, Perfect, we see you, Kristen. Awesome, thank you. That was so fascinating to watch and I was following along a little bit on my, on my smartphone and just, I really enjoyed learning about that. Thank you, Clara, and thank you, Amy. Yeah, so next month we are going to have another app training for citizen science activities. Uh, we are going to learn more about marine debris apps, and that will be on Thursday, April 15th at uh, 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern, so same time and almost the same date as this one. And I just want to say thank you very much to everyone for joining. Um, this was a, a really great opportunity, and I am very excited about everything that the Paddle the Gulf and you know, related efforts are doing. Thank you.